Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, a psychotherapist and the author and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director in our studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our um, thoughts, our feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I will share with you the tip of the week about how we contribute constantly to the fights and altercations that come on our way daily. And then I will talk about how to talk to people who are resistant to conversations and uh, just won't budge in the Ask Me segment. And I'm excited to bring you Dr. Jeremy Sherman. He has a PhD in evolutionary epistemology and a master's in public policy. He's the author of the Columbia University Press book, Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Selves, but also 1,000 articles with 9 million readers of psycho, uh, psychology today. And on everyday practicalities, including how to deal with total jerks. His latest book that we are going to talk about today is called What's Up With A-Holes? Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners. Yes, you heard it right. We're going to have an amazing conversation. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast and connect with me through all of the social media, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of them, Dr. Fujian Zane. And I would love to hear from you and everything that you want to tell me, feedback, questions, all of it. But first, here's the tip of the week. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach for the past 30 years. And I'm the originator of the Awareness Integration Therapy. I'd love to be able to support you in any matters of life that shows up for you that you need support. So call me at 818-648-2140. I am available to do online therapy or coaching, anyone who's around the world. And my, you can also join me in my office in San Clemente, California, if you'd like to uh, come to the office. So call me at 818-648-2140 or go to fujon.com. I look forward to hearing from you and having the opportunity to support you in things that are in your life and you just want to excel and create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Here's the tip of the week. When there's a fight, altercation, or a conflict, most people look at how the other person behaved what the other person intended, and how it impacted them. Rarely, people also look at what they did to provoke, cause, promote, elevate, and create the conflict or the escalation of the communication toward a full-blown fight. A well-intended wife who truly cares for her husband constantly disciplines her husband toward eating healthy and going to work dressed in a particular way until the husband sets a very harsh boundary by yelling and leaving the house. A mid-level manager who wants to be promoted to the top executive level but has lots of contempt for his boss and talks to him with a chip on his shoulder and a sense of entitlement or a beautifully young woman who isolates herself without communicating, stops responding, and goes on dates with the others to take revenge and complains that her mate is too controlling. A mother of a teenage girl who constantly watching and dictating what her daughter should do until her teen yells at her to leave her alone. Unfortunately, until we become aware of our own part, in an incident, take responsibility and attempt to revise it. We will recreate similar results over and over again. When we are disconnected from our behavior and act unconsciously, we tend not to notice how we co-created the outcome. Therefore, we cannot see alternative ways of behaving that may have been more favorable to get the more favorable results. 
If the well-intended wife notices that her husband cringes and looks the other way and pretends to ignore her when she disciplines him like a child, she may share her caring words or suggestions so that he can receive the care and love without feeling humiliated or controlled. If the manager notices that his body language and tonality reveals his contempt to his boss and that his sense of entitlement angers the boss, he may inquire who he needs to be and what kind of attitude he could have to be appreciated and noticed by his boss and get promoted just the way he wanted it. If the young woman realizes that someone who's anxious and mistrusts needs to feel secure, then instead of promoting this anxiety, uh, which leads to anger and controlling behavior by refusing to communicate and go on revenge dates, she could also ask him how she could create safety and security for him so that they can get closer to each other. By visualizing what we intend to create, we can gear our behavior and communication toward the creation of what we desire. It takes multi-level awareness for us to be observant of our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and impact on others. Usually, we pay attention to what is happening to us and automatically react. It's great to also have a camera on toward ourselves to see every word and action that we bring into the equation. Every action leads to some result. If the result is not what we like, then it is important to distinguish what we do that takes us away from our intention and what can we do so that we can create what we intend. Observing the impact of our words and actions on others, on other people, will give us constant information in how to gear and shift our action so that we can be happy and fulfilled with the results that we consistently create in our relationships. Thank you. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zane. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. How do we handle dealing with someone who is consistently righteous about a scenario? I see this a lot with couples where um, they, each one of them believes a particular way of um, doing something and um, they will defend it to death and they will tell each other that their way is right. And um, it is hard for them to negotiate and come to see that some other way may also be okay for them. I've also have the experience of people coming to me, hiring me, wanting to hear um, how I can show them and to have some skills. But even as I say the skills, that they will resist it and they don't want to hear it. It's very dear to them that the way they are doing something, although it's not working for them, that it needs to be um, handled with care and not just negated. So how do we handle that? One of the things that I've noticed is in front of other people becoming righteous, maybe we also become righteous. Maybe we take on the same kind of mirroring and then it's two people who have become righteous. It's as if if the other person puts their foot down and says, that's just the way it is. Maybe our way of protection is also just to say, oh yeah, it's my way also. 
and this is the way it is. Or if I give in to yours because there's no other way, then I would be losing the power or losing the game or I would feel inferior. So what I've noticed, especially with long-term relationships, such as marriages, working together, family members, good friends who really enjoy each other's relationship and want to continue, is that whenever I found that there's a part of me that is now withholds also, and I'm getting frustrated because I'm not being heard, to also look at maybe I'm not listening, maybe I'm not hearing. And sometimes they would even say, but you're not hearing me. You're not letting me talk. And then I have to stop. And I'm like, you're right. I'm not letting you talk. And um, I'm not listening. Well, how's that going to go for if I'm not willing to listen? And then yet what I do is to let them know that they're the one who are resisting me. This constantly happens in communication. So my suggestion, and this is something that I'm practicing every day, so I just wanted to share that with you, is whenever that I feel that I'm stomping into a dead end, and internally I feel either hopeless, powerless, and then turn around with that, with frustration, as if I'm not going through, I've learned to stop shut my mouth, open my ears, and allow someone else to be in, allow their talk, their thought process, their logic, the way they put things together to come in so that I can be in their world, although it might be very different than mine, have an understanding and compassion about what's going on in their world. See the view of the world from their perspective. It makes me grow. I will learn what it is about them that insists on being that way or saying it that way or wanting it, desiring it, whatever it is that they are adamant about having. I've noticed that when I open my ears, my heart, and uh, compassion into allowance of a conversation to be, and willing to learn from it and willing to negotiate and see what it is they want and for me to come into that world. And after I've allowed that, then to ask and request for me to be heard, sometimes the allowance is there and they will also have the ability, now that I've heard them, to open their ears and hear me out or be willing to also learn from me and sometimes they won't. They just will be feeling hurt, but they don't um, give back that gift of doing it for me. Still, I've noticed that the points of negotiation in the conversation or moving forward with a conversation, even if we agree to disagree, it ends well. It ends with concept of humanity of connecting, hearing, understanding, and even if we don't come to an agreement, at least keeping our humanness together and uh, remaining in the relationship that we have, knowing that we're going to be different in some ways. So how do you, diff how do you handle people you call difficult? It's get off your own difficultness and allow the space for openness, for growth, and hoping that that way of being will also smooth the space to move forward with the highest level of regards for both, for them to respect you because you respected them. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. This is Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am excited to be with Dr. Jeremy Sherman. He is a cradle to grave science researcher and a writer studying uh, the unbroken chain from the origins of life, from chemistry to humankind's grave situation today. He has a PhD in evolutionary epistemology and a master's in public policy. 
He's the author of the Columbia University Press book, Neither Ghost Nor Machine, The Emergence and Nature of Selves, but also 1,000 articles with 9 million readers for psychology today on everyday practicalities, including how to deal with total jerks. Don't we need that? Um, and maybe sometimes the jerk within us. For 25 years, he has been a close researcher, collaborator with Harvard Berkeley neuroscientists, Terence Deacon, and his latest book is called, Hey, What's Up With A-Holes? Advanced Psychoproctology for Beginners. Sherman's all about making advanced ideas intuitive, practical, and funny because he is a natural science perspective because the human condition is truly ironic. Welcome to the show. What a pleasure to be here. So glad to be here. Um, I love the title of the book, definitely. Um, so let's do this. Let's first define two words. One, psychoproctology. And then why would you call a human being an a-hole? Great, great questions. So psychoproctology is a light name for a serious subject. The, seri the serious subject has two big questions. The first one is, what is a butthead or what distinguishes a butthead since it can't just be whomever I or you happen to butt heads with? That is, it's a pursuit of a more objective, you could say scientific, um, way of distinguishing incorrigible people, literally uncorrectable people. So that's the first question. And the second question is a practical one, which was how can you prevent and stop buttheads without becoming one yourself. So in sum, the question is, how do you humbly humble people who will say or do anything to keep from being humbled? And I consider that a very important question for us to deal with, almost an existential question, because if anything is going to do us in as a species, it's when we get overrun by buttheads. So that's a, that's, that's a, that's the the field, but I want to point out, I chose a light name for it because you cannot afford to take yourself too seriously in this serious work. That is, if you look at the world's most famous, notorious buttheads, they all assumed they were authorities on who were the buttheads. So this is really dangerous and touchy work to get into. That is the whole topic of psychoproctology. Um, it's almost fighting words to, to broach it. I had the experience this weekend of just describing some of that on Facebook and the quantity of responses I got that were vehemently opposed to even raising the questions fascinated me. The people who said everyone's a butthead or no one's a butthead or you, uh, there's no humbly humbling them or you don't need to humble them uh, or one shouldn't humble them. Uh, love is the answer all sorts of responses that basically deflect the questions that I've taken seriously for about 20 years. So you also uh, attempted to define, which I like us uh, to uh, open this conversation, that yeah. the difference between uh, an act that sometimes a person does, which is jerkish. It's right. not okay because they are belittling others or hurting others, or there's something that is selfish without taking other people into account. And another one is um, an, an ambiance or a creation of um, a way a person is, um, you know, in, in ideas. So there might be a couple of ideas that the person on all other ideas, they're not, but on some, they become very like adamant about it and then they become very rigid about it and uh, in that rigidity uh, they might be uh, hostile violent um, acting in a particular way where they're not looking at aspect of it and the third one would be someone which we kind of like stamp it as if they are that uh, so can you distinguish between where is it that we you know uh, finally stamp it which I think for a lot of people don't like to be right, stamped right. And in, as a whole person. Yes, yes. So that, and that relates to your second question from earlier. Um, so one of the fundamental challenges I have to deal with uh, working in psychology and social psychology is the recognition that we are all um, prone to confirmation bias. We all uh, lie to some extent. Um, 
we are all hypocrites. To, uh, we are all engage in hypocritical behavior. Um, we all uh, uh, dig in our heels. Uh, all of that's true of all of us. So what then is the distif- difference between all of us lying sometimes and a liar? What's the difference between someone who engages in hypocrisy sometimes and a hypocrite? These are these are easily dismissed. We all in in everyday folk psychology, if someone lies to you about something that bothers you, we we want all sorts of tact and diplomacy. We want people to lie to us in some way. But if I'm bothered by someone's lie to me, my natural response will be to accuse them of being a liar. Okay, so so this is a fundamental question I have to deal with in the book. Now there are moral aspects. Uh, there are moral you could say, um, criticisms of the whole project that come from basically that school of thought that says blame the sin and not the sinner, or don't call people names, don't be a name caller. Now, I have to address that in the book as well, because I actually do think that there are situations, first of all, we name call all the time. If I, some, if I say that someone's a lovely person, I'm actually name calling, and I don't forget that they're a person. If I say that someone's talented or uh, a medical doctor, I don't forget that they're human. So the idea that name calling is inherently deter- um, dehumanizing, I, I don't find evidence for that. Um, uh, I end up thinking of uh, being a butthead as a lifestyle, and actually the term being is important to me here. Um, Uh, I do this origins of life research where we talk about us as living beings. Being is an interesting word. It's a verb about maintaining a static state. It's basically nouning. So to be a living being takes ongoing work. Um, That's, uh, and that's often overlooked even in the sciences where we pretend the DNA creates a body and the body is kind of like a machine. And so, uh, there's that, but I would also say that being a butthead has that same quality. It is a state that is maintained. It is a habit that's maintained, and at the extreme, it becomes wall to wall. Wall to wall, as you suggested, can be on a, with certain people. That is, people can be nice to some people, but buttheads to others, or on certain topics, or for, for certain uh, times in the day. There are plenty of people who are decent, normal people during the day, and then they troll at night for for, for fun and pleasure. So, um, the the I I gained some insight into how I think about this from revisiting an old uh, quote that is often misquoted. People say power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's not the original quote. The original quote is power tends to corrupt, uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Tends to is important to me. Lying tends to corrupt. It doesn't always corrupt. Sometimes it's just what the doctor ordered, you know, diplomacy and all of that. But absolute, when you do become absolute, when your confirmation bias becomes the solution to all problems you encounter, that's when I think someone has actually adopted the absolute uh, butthead lifestyle. So this is what I'm hearing from you, that if someone, and I say it um, on another way, uh, because I think that most of the time when we say say things from three, four different ways, it finally like, you know, it hammers. That's right, triangulation. So what if somebody has taken on a a way of behaving as a strategy that worked for them? So obviously it had to work for them at one point, right? Like unless you uh, believe that people just kind of like get born that way or they uh, try out different ways of being, even being a butthead, and then suddenly it works. Maybe it gives them power. Maybe it gives them like superiority. Maybe it gives them safety in their own, you know, rigidity, whatever it is that it does. Um, that they create it as a strategy to be utilized in different places. And then I'm sensing what you're saying is if that type of strategy now is chosen most places and uh, with most people in their life and in all areas of life, then they have chosen the being to be that. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, chosen would, I wouldn't think of it cho- as chosen, but here, but I would say, so you're onto a very important insight from my perspective. Um, 
uh, about what's going on with this lifestyle. First of all, I want to recognize that it is extremely tempting to become a butthead if you can get away with it. It's way easier to play God than it is to be human. And so the second whole part of the book is how to make this lifestyle costly um, so, that it, so that it's not worth it, so that people don't get away with it. The second point relevant to what you're saying comes from the middle ground of my work. So I do work in the origins of life uh, with this Harvard Berkeley neuroscientist, biological anthropologist. Um, he also had, uh, previous to en our encounters, had written a book on the evolution of human language and how it changes us. It's a book called The Symbolic Species. And when I first read it in 1996, I cried, not because it was moving, just because it was very difficult. I'm not a neuroscientist. So anyway, you got the origins of life, the evolution of language, and then this interest of mine in psychoproctology. Well, language is interesting for just the reason you described. We, we often act for civil, uh, to be civilized, we act as though people mean what they say and have thought about what they said and have defined words before they use them. I do not think that's the norm for us at all. Mostly what we do is we stumble on a way of saying something and if it works, we'll keep saying it. It's just a habit. It's almost like braying. It's an animal sound that in humans would happen to manifest as words. Now, and you get away with it by convincing other people that you mean your words. So I am often accused of, of, of anyone who talks in psychoproctology is bound to be interpreted as having a bone to pick. That is a book on what's up with a-holes is likely to be the author's vindication with some audience that they don't like, some people that they disagree with, someone. So it would be a book on how to, uh, um, you know, how to butt heads with the people I butt heads with, that kind of thing. Um, no, it turns out I'm lucky here. My, my approach is completely nonpartisan. It's not about what people believe. I don't think that butt heads believe things. I think that they parrot and ape sounds that work. That's what's going on. So it's not about what they pretend to believe. It's about how they strut it. It's a lifestyle choice. And I know buttheads of all varieties. And as you said early on, I can't put it past me the possibility that I'm the butthead too. I have to keep that in mind. That is, it, it, it's, it's a lifestyle that is very tempting to humans for the reasons you describe. It's a way of, if you can get away with it, it's a way of having absolute safety and absolute freedom. You can do whatever you want if you're a butthead, and whatever you do is always the best. So I'm confused because as you explained it right now, you called it a choice of a lifestyle. And then yeah. when I was saying the word choice, you had paused on it. So tell me what was it about the word? I, I, sorry, it was, it was about who's doing the choosing. Um, I misunderstood you. I thought that you were maybe saying that uh, that they were chosen to be buttheads, and I'm I'm saying no, they chose, but also the choosing isn't very active. Right. Um, I think we slide into it. It's there are detours to a holia on any path that any human could take. They're just a, it's a standard temptation. It would be tempting to any human, and it takes work to resist that temptation to simply become unreasonable because I said so um, would be a natural temptation for all humans. So yes, choosing or falling into it would be, I, I agree with you, that is, that is what we're talking about. That is how people end up being this way um, by many different paths. I don't think that you can diagnose it auto, uh, biographically. Right. That is, there are people who fall into it because they happen to live in a culture that's going through a cult epidemic, whether on the left or on the right or religious or whatever. Um, there are people who um, are used to having their expectations met, and so they come to feel entitled to it. There are people who never have their expe expectations met and then reach for it because it's simply the only way they can cope. All sorts of paths and all sorts of motivations for becoming, for entering this lifestyle. But once you have, if you can get away with it, there would be little reason to leave it, which was to your point. 
And there's this, um, the lifestyle, as I hear you, it does, um, if they can enroll others, because there's also this conversation of how do some buttheads um, enroll others into who they are, while others would be like, shunned away immediately, kicked out of the family system, kicked out of the um uh, you know, businesses and stuff. And they're like, no, like you're not acting appropriately. You're not going to be there. But right. then there are people who have the ability to um, uh, enroll others in the power of, you know, their buttheadness, let's say, or a hole. Right. Right. Uh, so what do you see as you have looked upon the natural selections? Because I love this. There's a natural selection in my life. <laughs> like, Those who, there, some are born butthead, some choose to be butthead, and some have butthead in this, uh, thrust upon them, whatever. Uh, no, it's, these are great questions. And I know I read, um, yeah, I've read this recent book called Cultish that attempts to address that question. I read a number of the books. I think I, I read about a book a week in audio. And so one of the problems is I don't always know where I'm citing, but this question has been live for me for a while. And it certainly has been live in some of the books I've read lately. One thing is whether there is cultural resonance. Um, that is, uh, we are way better at spotting the buttheadedness in our opponents than we are in our own cultures. Um, so, so there's that. Um, uh, there's a beat them or join them quality to it. Uh, that is, uh, if you don't feel like you can beat a butthead, you might align with them. You might actually be coerced or almost blackmailed into it. I think that that happens a lot in seats of power. Um, uh, there's a there's a wonderful political scientist who writes about this with a um, with an unusual name, De Bueno de, Mos de Mosca is his last name. He's American. I think he might even be Jewish, probably Sephardic Jew. But anyway, he, he's written at great length about how cronyism works. And he's, uh, he's most famous for coming up with some really um, well-proven predictions early on through his analysis of how cronies join in. Um, a lot of us back off when it's simply not worth putting up a fight with these guys. And there's a lot to be said for that. Um, a, a famous quote, often misattributed to George Bernard Shaw, is never fight with a pig, you'll just get dirty and the pig likes it. Now, um, I like that quote, but I also can't say never, not at all. There are, there are pigs you have to fight and you will get dirty, but the point is to make it so the pig doesn't like it. And how to do that is a big part of what's going on in this book. Um, that what I'm trying to get at in this book, how to humbly humble, that is without becoming a butthead yourself, how to humbly humble someone who will say or do anything um, uh, to keep from uh, being humbled because they, they treat it as kind of humiliation, kiss of death. So, um, yeah, so, so who joins and who doesn't? There are a lot of factors, but I would also say that one thing fundamental about it is this abiding a temptation to become an a-hole, being playing God f for whatever cause or no cause at all is way easier than being human. And so there will be a lot of wannabes who simply envy the glory and authority, authority and association they get to have through aligning with someone who plays God. When you think about it, they can pretend they are humbled before a higher power a demagogue, a god, it could be a spiritual religious thing, but in the process, they earn the right, they're deputized, they earn the right to lord it over others. So they're humbled before some, uh, some demagogue, and as a, result, as a result, they get some of that demagogue's power. They get to speak on that demagogue's behalf. So it'd be very tempting. So the, the part that is tempting is still the power that the person assumes because when, let me put it this way, let me spell the beans on myself. Please. <laughs> uh, whenever that I have felt like I am a butthurt or a jerk or an a-hole, it's been a pretense of a power that I own that I really don't have. But it just like sitting in that uh, delusional throne at a moment 
Yes. Um, and then even ha 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 laughing at it. Um, it does appear to be an interesting fantasy. So then I get what you're saying, which I can find another person who can also get into my delusion that I am sitting on the throne and I actually do have some power. Yeah. Um, then I got some followers here. And if I can just get enough people in my delusions, then I it will be all good. It's just that my problem, I could say that I wasn't a good enroller in that. And I couldn't get enough people in my delusion. At one point, somebody said, or, or I hurt someone. And then maybe my compassion in the middle, since I wasn't the full, full narcissist, the compassion in hurting someone by that behavior kind of like kicked me off my delusion on the throne. And it's like, ouch, like, you know. Yeah. Um, or that someone else showed up with a bigger delusion and a bigger throne, an all gold throne. <laughs> and then I looked really inferior with my throne in front of theirs. And they had a bigger follower. And then I said, oh, oh, I don't like theirs. Then, um, oh, so I'll just get off mine and be with the inferior people and the underdog against the um the you know the, the alpha dog right the elites the, the the elites with the gold throne would be an example of that yes <laughs> um but that's my personal experience but with your but, but there's a lot to be there's a lot to be harvested there yes um uh i've long thought if you don't want to be a butthead expect some anxiety um, and usually anxiety on two sides of the uh, of of all these dilemmas we're all dealing with, like was I too assertive in that situation or not assertive enough? In fact, the closest I get to feeling settled or like I've got equanimity is if I worry about opposite things in equal measure. Was I too assertive, not assertive enough? If I if I'm worrying about both, I'm probably close to where I can bet I should be for now. Um, so, so anybody who worries or wonders or is checked about whether they are a butthead and doesn't just come to the conclusion that they aren't is probably not one. That is, I want to keep alive the question of whether I am a butthead. I want to pre-grieve it so I'm not shocked should someone accuse me of it, but I also don't want to pre-grieve it to the point where I'm inoculated against it like I've already worried about that and I'm over it. No, I want to keep it live in my own consideration. Now, um, uh, I also believe we have to play God. Um, and this is also a function of language. We are, if you compare what a human could worry about to what a dog could worry about, you begin to appreciate why we would be an incredibly anxious species. I think of us as trudging through a sandstorm of mojo uh, degenerating possibilities, all the threats, all the missed opportunities that you can stay up late wondering about. And a dog can't, and a dog can't because of language, I would argue. Now, in addition to it making us very anxious bunnies, having all this language and all these possibilities that we can imagine, real and, and uh, imaginary, um, we have really easy ways to escape any of them that annoy us. That is, we can rationalize not thinking about things, and we sort of have to. But what I want to say about us is that we, we would be an especially, especially visionary and delusional species, we would be especially anxious and denialist as species would go. And we were dealing with the same thing that all species are dealing with. They want, we talk like we want free will. No, we want free will to climb. We want determinism to hold us. We want safety and freedom. And with language, we can get, we can imagine figments of total satisfaction on both fronts. And that's what it's like to be an a-hole or a butthead. Now, I think, my best guess at how to prevent a holery in real life is through what I call optimal illusion. As I have to play God, um, I just do it offline. When I'm watching fiction, if I'm watching a Marvel comic movie, uh, movie, I'm identifying with the noble heroes who know what to do and are powerful and right and righteous and mighty. And I totally believe it even though, of course, I know it's not true. When I turn off the TV, I'm done. I'm back to reality. So for me, it's not how far out you go into that playing God business. It's whether you remember to come back. 
you know, take your flights of fancy, but always with a return ticket to reality safely in your heart pocket. So that's one of the elements of how I think we, we have to deal with it. We have to elevate entertainment to a necessity. We have to elevate escapism to a human necessity and then demote the highfalutin versions of it that claim that they are, that their fantasy is more real than reality. Um, so I want to demote those kind of sacred cow versions of escapism to an elevated level at which I hold all hobbies, all entertainments, what I call ventertainment. It's a way of venting that need we have to imagine that we've landed on a plateau of perfect freedom and safety. So, so that's part of the, the treatment I think we all need to uh, respect the need for escapism, safe escapism, optimal illusion, kidding ourselves where it helps more than harms. You talk about reality check. So then this question came about for me. Um, if a person's reality, if they have actually created a very small reality-based concept for themselves, yeah. and that's all that they see as reality, they, they all they did was more like, I'm answering my own question. They just kind of expanded their delusion. So they're not really coming back into reality at all. Because if you do really come back, you know, when the commercials come up, when you come back yeah. to reality, I think there's enough feedback in the world if you wanted to check that would tell you whether, you know, the rest of the human humankind and animals around you are also buying into, you know, your godness or not. And, uh, but most of the people who are in that space, they, they get the feedback, but they just dump it as if like, no, that's not real. And if they, are, if I have two or three, yes, ma'am, or yes, ma'am, yes, sir, people yeah. around me, then I'm just going to choose that that is the only uh, part of the feedback from the outside world, which I'm going to bring into my delusion and just kind of stay in my uh, throne for a while. Yeah, beautiful. So the, the, the psychologist uh, Otto Rank come up, came up with a term I like a lot, partialization, which is treating your little something as everything. And um, we all need some of that. That's how we stay motivated. That is, I, you know, there's a, there would be something about us that would, would want to feel like we're on a crusade. Someone who was very influenced by uh, um, Rank, a guy named Ernest Becker, an anthropologist, argued that we will always, if we're primed on our own uh, mortality, we will cling to what he calls an immortality project. You can think of it as a crusade. So I'm part of the good people. I'm among the good people. And those people who disagree with me are losers or failures or something like that. Now, that would be something that would be uh, true of all of us. We would all have that tendency. It's another way of talking about confirmation bias. The trick is whether you find what I'll call the wild card trump card formula by which you can deflect all challenges to your authority about reality. So typically what will happen is, we'll, it, and it's a, it's a simple toolkit of, of terms or tricks that one can employ in the service of any cause you choose, any immortality project of your choice. And it just means that anybody who challenges you is just trying to win, is just trying to, uh, it, and it's, it's like, a, it's a, I counted in my book about 85 different standard moves in current culture that we use to play the wild card, trump card formula. Wild card is I can do whatever I want. I have total freedom. And the trump card is whatever I do is best. And you can do all of that stuff automatically um, if you get in the habit of it and if you can get away with it. So um, so I end up, by the end of the book, I'm not, I don't like the word uh, any of the vulgarisms for this behavior, butthead behavior. Um, and I don't like even the clinical names. I don't think narcissists actually gets at what's going on with them. I don't actually think that they are particularly, it's a habit is what I'm trying to say. Whether they think more of themselves, they certainly appear like they think more of themselves, these buttheads, but I don't actually think that's necessarily going on with them. I call them Trump bots. 
and not after Donald Trump, though I do think he does represent this lifestyle very well. Trump means two things. It means fake, as in trumped up, and it means beats all else, as in trump card. So this is a robotic habit that could be applied by anyone. I have leftist spiritual Buddhist friends who I think are mighty tempted by the Trump bot formula. Um, they seem to be moving in that direction. Once again, it's not what they, it's not what you claim to believe or who you pander to. It's how you strut it, as if it's hermetically sealed, as if nothing could ever get into to you. And I also think that's why all buttheads have a similar quality, regardless of what they claim to believe. It's a formula. It's a really simple formula. And it does exactly what you describe. It enables you to deflect all challenges and to partialize absolutely. And the term absolute is really interesting this way because what it really means, what it originally meant was dissolved away from. That right. is, nothing can influence you. That's what it originally meant. But also, when you're talking about the term narcissism as uh, it's coined in psychotherapy, I think that it does have a range of uh, whether someone has a, a psychological um, uh, you know, way of being which doesn't work for them or others around them. But I think that the, when you talk about a personality disorder and not just the, you know, the range of characteristics that might be in that cluster, uh, they've ha they have closed up. Now, very early in life, they've closed up. They've created that, this delusion and that's the only way that it works for them as far as safety. And they've chosen that safety mode of, everything that happens, either I'm great or obviously you're bad. And they just kind of, you know, keep that type of a safety space. And that's why when you, if there's any feedback from the external world, there's such a harsh rage, because if that, if, if there's any, any, any um, way of any of these negative feedbacks coming in, the person will shatter. So they're very much um, have to, in order for them to survive, to hold this castle around that yes. I am me in my throne and nobody else can come in. Yes. So, uh, so what I'm raising here is a question that would not necessarily be popular in, uh, in clinical psychology. I am, all of what you just described is, uh, is the quality that I'm interested in with the, one of the most popular terms in folk psychology, a hole or butthead, all of those terms that don't get addressed in uh, psycho uh, in psychology directly very much. That is, I mean, I know this from personal experience. I, I now am writing a column called Jerkology. Uh, I want to call it psychoproctology, but, psycho uh, but psycho psychology today wouldn't permit it. And I have had to deal over and over with um, writing articles that mention uh, butthead or something like that in the title and and are looked at with a little bit of skepticism as if the folk psychology term has no equivalent in psychology. It has a subset. There are psychopaths, uh, often considered congenital. There are sociopaths. There are narcissists. And by the way, those are the hottest topics on Psychology Today blogs. The hottest topic, I would say, other than how to improve your sex life, is how to, nar how to justify nar uh, diagnosing your ex as a narcissist. The challenge I'm trying to raise, though, is this. I know that they present as egomaniacs. I completely get that. But I'm trying to understand what's going on underneath that inside them, what it, what it feels like to them, not what it feels like to me as an observer. And I'm raising this possibility that I don't see raised much, which is that this would be a natural tendency for any human if they can get away with it, if they are education deprived, and I think it becomes a habit. You could say it's an addiction. So let's take a let's draw a parallel. Suppose I got deeply addicted to alcohol. Um, if someone deprives me of it, I might lash out at them, and I could. I'm just making this up, so I could be. This may flop. Let me see how I do here. Um, uh, from the outside, I look like I am deeply addicted to the joys of alcohol. On the inside, it could be that I am deeply addicted, not to the joys. The joys are gone. It's now a habit. It's a, it, but if you deprive me of it, I freak out. And also with narcissism, 
or with, with, with narcissism or buttheadedness, the freak out is part of the theatrical presentation. We now know, I mean, you, you got a guy like Michael Cohen who worked for Trump all, all those years, and he says it's a kind of method acting. He says, you, you, I was perfectly capable of acting as though I was viscerally outraged at as an injustice to me, while knowing or not knowing, it didn't really matter to me whether I knew that there was no injustice to me. So the, the, all of the theatrical outrage and disappointment and uh, shaken to the coreness that we see in a narcissist when they're poked or prodded could also be part of the robotic habit. I just questioned this one thing about whether these guys are actually self-infatuated the way an alcoholic could be misinterpreted as really loving alcohol or whether they're actually Jones, whether they've just come to depend upon a habit that if you take it away, it, it becomes a problem. It's a question I'm not claiming to know the answer, but I do think that buttheadedness is a broader category than narcissism and psychopathy and needs to be addressed as such. Um, I think the only piece that I would want to distinguish here yeah. is when we're looking at something as a mental illness and that actually from a clinical term that we have to diagnose because of a set of structure or on a popular level, people just use a term to uh, excite something, you know, like a psychopath is not an actual diagnosis <clears throat> or the way that people, everybody's now diagnosing their uh, past uh, mate it's not that people are really trying to create a clinical, they're just trying to create a label which has some characteristics. So that's the only- and, But also it has, has the clinical, um, uh, it sounds clinical, even yeah. though basically what they're not. saying that my ex was a butthead it's, or something like that. Right, so that's why I'm trying to distinguish between actual clinical childhood wounding of a narcissist so that they, that person, to me, it's almost like either, you know, whether if you are in psychosis at that moment, yes, you believe in what you're actually seeing. You are believing what you're hearing. You are believing that and you are going to have a reaction if somebody's going to take that away from you. When I worked 30 years with addicts, it is truly a belief at that moment that has gotten warped where this drug is giving me my existence. And if I don't have it right now, I will die. For a period of time, that delusion is so real. It's no longer like, you know, it, it goes into kind of like that part of the delusion and psychosis or the, uh, you know, it's not just the neurotic aspect. I do agree with that. However, um, for actually for the people surrounding, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. They don't like it anyway. It doesn't matter what they call it. They don't like it. It doesn't matter um, how and where the causality is. For them, they still have to set their boundaries and figure out what they do. Right, right, yes. But as far as the person themselves, then the point, as I hear you also is, when will it be that this person can come out of their delusion? Can we, if we make it all clear and beautiful for them, why would they have the incentive to come out of their delusion? It's right. beautiful. It works for them. If, it, if at least other people will not make it that beautiful, the same thing they say, tough love with, you know, addicts, if you don't make it beautiful for them and for them to actually head down. So at one point they're like, you know, this delusion just doesn't work for me. Maybe I need to look at it. Right, another. right. And my survival has to be another way. And you'll see that the same way some addicts will prefer to die and commit suicide or overdose because they're not willing to come out of their delusions. There are also people who are in that space of narcissism that they will fight until death to do them apart and will not at any point uh, let go of that delusion because letting go of that delusion means their ego death. And then, you know, to them, that ego death means also their physical death. So I, I have, I, I agree with that. But the, the example that you talked about, this person is clearly aware that they are doing the method acting, clearly aware of choosing to use that as a strategy most of the time. And maybe when they are method acting, their whole physical being also does it. So for a brief period, they go into the delusion, but they're like you said, I can go into the entertainment, come out in the uh, commercial time, 
and check out what reality. And sometimes like the person is so much in it that they just don't have any break time to come and check with the reality in that sense. So um, we are so crushed in time and I'm enjoying our conversation so much. Unfortunately, we won't have time. I want to give you one minute to wrap up anything we haven't said and you really want our audience to know. Yeah, I, I have to respond to what you just said. Please. This is, I, I, I dedicate the book to future psychoproctologists who will do better, uh, who will improve on the content herein, in the book. Um, this is the beginning of a long conversation. There are real differences from my perspective between addicted, uh, being addicted to a substance, for example, and being addicted to BS, BS being defined as not caring what's true. Um, I have to be careful not to project a kind of rational mind on the people who I'm trying to understand this way, because as Mary Trump says in her recent book, sometimes Trump knows he's lying, sometimes he knows he, he doesn't care. It do, it, it's much more mercurial or slippery in these minds. It's a different kind of addiction, I would argue. And I and above all, I, I am not I am not dismissing the term narcissist or any of those terms, I'm trying to understand this broader category. I think there are people who fall through the cracks. They are not clinically diagnosable and they are not criminally diagnosable. Or, or, And I think we need to get come to terms with it. That is, we knew Hitler was a, uh, was a psychopath or a narcissist. We couldn't necessarily say that about everyone who joined him. And there's got to be a way of talking about that broader category. So that's where I, that's where my focus continues to be. It's it's ongoing work. I consider it a fruitful exercise in futility. I'm not going to come to objective conclusions about this. I'm just trying to uh, to further the work. Beautiful, Dr. Jeremy Sherman. Everyone, please uh, get the book. Uh, What's up with a holes? Advanced Pro uh, psychoproctology for beginners. Um, Dr. Sherman, where can people find uh, you and this book? Well, you can find way too much of me anywhere on the internet simply by hitting go uh, by Googling my name. I have a website called jeremysherman.com, one word, Jeremy Sherman, no hyphen, um, where I list the, the eight research questions I work on. I haven't fully filled it out. I'm planning to do that this week, but the media page is uh, fully populated. The book is not out yet. Um, anybody can email me, j uh, jeremysherman.com, js at Jeremy Sherman, my initials at my name, and I can send a PDF of it. But also, it's out already as a podcast. So just look up that podcast if you're interested in more on this wonderful topic, psychoproctology. Beautiful. It was a joy to have a conversation with you. Likewise, and you. And have you back with the origins of life. All right. Sounds good. Great talking with you. For all of you out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.